a few minutes and hopefully, uh, so we on? Yes. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, formally welcome to this meeting of the committee on the revision of the penal code, which is now in session. I'm Mike Romano, who's chair of the committee. Uh, thank you all for joining us, especially in these circumstances in this format. Uh, this is our sixth committee hearing. Um, I'm just gonna begin quickly with a roll call of committee members in alphabetical order. Senator Burton, I know that he cannot attend today. Judge Espinoza? I'm present. Uh, Assembly member Kam Lagerdove? Present. Justice Moreno? Uh, present. Uh, Dean Richardson? Present. And uh, Senator Skinner is not here, but hopefully will join us shortly. In any event, we have a quorum. So uh, let me give you a quick preview of our agenda today, and uh, then we'll get started. First, uh, we're very excited to hear from Attorney General Javier Becerra, um, who will address the committee for about 15 or 20 minutes. After uh, AG Becerra, there'll be two panelists of witnesses from major law enforcement and other groups in California to share their perspectives with the committee um, and our work to try to find uh, a better administration of justice, improve public safety and reduce unnecessary uh, incarceration. Members of the public will have a chance for comment after the panels and we expect that to start around 11.30 a.m. When that time comes, I'll explain how to line up for public comment. Please do not do so yet. Uh, we'll probably take uh, five minute breaks in between uh, the different panels along the way. Okay. With that said, I am very happy, honored, and excited to introduce our first guest today, Attorney General Javier Becerra. We are grateful to AG Becerra, which, who is of course our state's chief law enforcement officer to speak to the committee this morning. No one else in California has the statewide perspective that AG Becerra has in his office from representing the state in trial and appellate courts to safeguarding criminal history data that so many of our agents and actors rely on. Of course, as many other things that the Attorney General's office also does. Um, few people's perspective is as valuable to our work as yours, A.G. Becerra, and we thank you for joining us. We're eager to hear your thoughts. Thank you again for joining us. Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, I hope uh, to engage with you on some good conversation. Let me just say on behalf of everyone who is hoping that we continue forward to reform the way we do justice, not just criminal justice, but justice, that uh, we want you to succeed. We want you to give us the recommendations. You want, we want you to be in touch with us, give us the ideas. Uh, send us on a mission. Uh, let us all work together because there is a, no, a moment here where we could actually get some real stuff done for a lot of people. And California is the place that can make the mark best. So I, I, I encourage you to uh, push the envelope and count the, the men and women of the Department of Justice as people who want to help in that mission. Uh, let me give you a, a couple of stories. Uh, and before I do, just simply say, that on behalf of the people at the Department of Justice, and again, California DOJ includes not just the legal team that deals with uh, every aspect of the law, including criminal law. We do most of the appeals work for the people of, of the state of California, but we also, of course, have our division of law enforcement, which works day in, in day out with, and hand in hand with law enforcement from the federal government down to our local police partners every day. And in between, we also are the repository for most of the statistics that we rely on to guide us on where we go when it comes to issues of justice and certainly criminal justice. So I, I simply want to say on behalf of all the people we get to work with, and you're going to have a lot of great panelists today who work in law enforcement, uh, California really does want to move the, the mark here. We, we do want to make a difference. And I say that as someone who is now in law enforcement and someone who has worked with the folks in law enforcement who get it, who understand we need to move the dial. And so two, two quick stories. Um, when I was young, still a teenager, uh, I was pulled over. My friends and I were pulled over one evening by uh, a cruiser, a police uh, vehicle. I had done nothing wrong. Uh, we were just in a neighborhood, but my friends and I were pulled over. I was driving. Um, fortunately, nothing happened. The officer asked some questions, looked around, gave us all some looks and at the end, he, he let us go. 
I didn't think much of it other than we got away. We didn't get away. You know, no, nothing happened. We weren't cited. We, nothing happened. So I, I didn't make much of it at the time. Uh, now I make more of it now that I know the law because I was stopped without cause. And uh, there are many people who have been stopped without cause where something has happened. And so I look back at that and recognize that while we want to have safety, we have to still respect people's rights. Second point, uh, second story is this. Once I became an attorney, I worked for legal services uh, and I represented folks who were mentally ill. I did this at a time in the 1980s when we were in the, in the middle of a movement called deinstitutionalization of our folks who were mentally ill and who were locked up because we thought so long as we could give them treatment and keep them on a program, they could survive in the community and do well instead of being locked up. And so we deinstitutionalized a lot of folks with mental illness. Great idea bad in practice because we forgot to actually put the resources behind the community uh, uh, resources and activities needed to help people stabilize. And so we left them, we took them out of the institutions, but we didn't give them the net uh, in the community to help them survive well. And many of those folks became part of what we now know as the homeless population throughout the country that we've seen over the last several decades. Uh, I mentioned those two stories because for me, they inform much of what I do. And here's what I would say to you. If we're talking about reforming the penal code, if we're talking about criminal justice system in the courts, we're already a, a, a step behind. Because the moment you start talking about trying to cure something, remedy something, we've already missed the mark. Uh, my parents always used to tell me, mejor prevenir que remediar. Better to prevent than to remediate. Uh, Frederick Douglass said it just as well. He said, better to build strong children than to repair broken men. Uh, it is incumbent upon us to recognize that if we want to succeed when it comes to justice, especially criminal justice, the fewer times we have to go to the justice system to deal with people on, criminal, on a criminal ground, the better off we'll always be. And so I would simply say to you, the more you really get us towards investing in our kids, the less we'll have to worry about trying to uh, dispense justice for young, mostly men, mostly men of color. And so for me, the issue is trying to get there. Let's not deinstitutionalize without providing the network that's needed in the community to help folks. But let's also start thinking early about how we do these things. Why should we spend what is it? Uh, the same amount of money it would take to send a young man through UC Berkeley, both undergrad and graduate school, just for one year in a juvenile detention facility. It's incredible what we spend, uh, but that's the case. We could send a, a young man through eight years of Berkeley for the same price we spend to keep him locked up uh, for one year as a, as a juvenile. And so we need to do better when it comes to how we prevent versus remediate. Uh, but on the issue of remediation, let me tell you a couple of things that we're trying to do in the Department of Justice. We believe it's time and we've taken efforts and we helped spur the movement and, and the, you have some state legislators with you uh, who moved on the issue of bail. Uh, it's bad enough if you're gonna be incarcerated, but when you're incarcerated, you haven't yet been convicted, that's even worse. And you've got a lot of Californians who simply because they, they can't afford bail, remain behind bars. And this move towards uh, no money bail is something that we help promote as well. At the Department of Justice, we defend trial judges' bail determinations. In 2017 and 2018, I told my team that we would stop defending uh, judges' bail determinations if they didn't take into account a defendant's capacity to pay the bail. And so I, I think we helped spur some of that movement. The case that we really pushed this on, Henry Humphreys is now before the Supreme Court. And we intend to continue that push because no one should be behind the bars, lose their job, lose their college credit simply because they can't bail themselves out of jail. The second thing we're working on and hoping that the federal courts work with us on is effective counsel. Uh, it's, it's tough for me to, and I've told this to my team, it was tough for me to realize that uh, in order for you to 
uh, prove that you did not have effective counsel if the person who was your attorney believed you were in a, an inferior person. Uh, you had to have specific evidence of that. And so in the particular case at hand, Ellis, uh, we have a young, it was a, a man, African-American, who had as his attorney, appointed attorney, an avowed racist. Now, not, people, not everyone knew that, but at the end of the day, this man was an avowed racist. Uh, unless Mr. Ellis could show that uh, his attorney had specific animus towards him, and that animus caused him to have to receive less than effective counsel, Mr. Ellis was out of luck. I, I told my team that that's a standard that it's not, if it's not in law, we should break it because if someone is racist against me, the last thing I should ever have is someone appointing that person to be my counsel, period. And so we're hoping to move in that direction to again, prevent a situation where you get tried and you're ultimately convicted. And now you have to undo, you have to remediate by trying to prove that your counsel was never truly effective in giving you Sixth Amendment rights to effective counsel. Uh, I mentioned those things because it's important to move forward. And here's my final point. And I hope you can hear me because I've got guard, there are gardeners next door who are blowing, so I don't know how much you can hear that. But here's my final point. Law enforcement is being asked to do a whole lot. And, and uh, I believe that most of the men and women in our agencies are doing everything they can. And many are going above and beyond. Uh, we still have to root out those that haven't ca caught up to the 21st century. But I, I think in California, we're moving in the right direction. But here's what I'll tell you. It, and, and here's the best example, homelessness. When someone is approached for being homeless, it's usually gonna be a cop. And that's because someone called 911. The more that we treat issues like homelessness, mental illness, uh, substance abuse as criminal problems, the more we're going to end up with incidents that no one likes. And I and I said this to my partners uh, up and down law enforcement, and I said it to policymakers as well. We need to get away from treating homelessness like a 911 criminal issue, because if we don't, you're getting people who've been trained in the academy to deal with threats, with violence, uh, to deal with homelessness when it's probably not in that realm. And we should really turn to pro provide our resources and our talents to getting people who really should be getting the 911 call on a homeless person and rather than our police. And so I say to you that better to prevent than to remediate, better to deal with things in a way that gets you the targeted approach. And if we do that, I think what we'll find is that California will once again, lead the way when it comes to reforms that we need to make our justice system as fair as possible. Let me stop there. Thank you. Um, I think that there's, I'll just speak for myself. I agree with almost everything that, that you said. Um, and, um, you know, not, ju not only do we have to make interventions before get people get into the criminal justice system, but frequently, especially with regard to homelessness and addiction, uh, the criminal, once you enter, you know, get locked up, it, those, those problems only get exacerbated and worse and you create a revolving downward spiral, which is obviously the opposite of what we want to achieve. And one of the things that I think that I've been surprised by uh, as we've been moving along is the incredible churn that there is between the street and the jails and, um, and, and how do we dis disrupt that cycle? Um, one thing that I'd like to ask with you, and we do look forward to working with you and your staff as we develop our, our recommendations, is it's been super critical for us, um, you know, perhaps it's biased because I'm in Silicon Valley, but to um, analyze the data as much as possible, because we really do believe people come to us every you know month, we have our hearings and they say, how about this program or how about that program or Prop 47 is a problem or this is a problem, but the data is very, very thin. And we're really trying very hard to get a, our arms around the data as best as possible. I realize that you are not gonna answer all the problems with data, but so much of our politics are driven by anecdote and we hope that we can especially get your partnership on collecting the data and, and developing it in ways to, to, to find genuine solutions, perhaps in areas that nobody had really realized were problems to begin with. Mr. Chairman, yeah, and I know that 
you, your team has been working with our office to try to collect data. You, uh, you could probably help us here. Uh, we are doing more with data than we've ever had to do in the past. Uh, the PRA requests that we're getting, the amount of information we're collecting, much of what is being done today in law enforcement uh, is being funneled through us as a repository, and we're overwhelmed, uh, quite honestly, with the requests. You can imagine, we, we have to deal with PRA requests by gun owners and folks who are suing us who want all the information about what we've done on, on our gun laws and in, in registering people. We're getting requests now on all, all the information. Senator Skinner's uh, legislation uh, uh, requires every agency to send us the information that they collect on, um, on personnel records for officers. We're now finding that some of those records have not been scrubbed before the agency send them to us and they have private information, social security numbers and the rest, which under a PRA request, we're gonna have to release uh, and no one wants it. So we're spending double, triple time just trying to scrub documents that we never even generated. And so uh, what I would ask is for you all to help us have the capacity to respond to the requests where the data could be very helpful uh, to be released. Uh, but we'll do everything we can, Mr. Chairman, to try to work with you because I agree, data should be the base of where we launch. Terrific. And when I say partnership, I genuinely mean it, not just, you know, both ways. I want, I love to help you guys as much as possible. And if you guys could help us, that would be, I mean, I genuinely believe that. Uh, uh, Judge Justice Moreno, I believe you had a question. Yeah, just a, a question and a comment. And thank you for joining us, Mr. Attorney General. Your views are, are greatly appreciated. I want to direct you to an article in this morning's LA Times about the rise in violent crime. Uh, particularly in Los Angeles, but also in many cities across the country. Uh, the article points out that in Los Angeles alone, there have been 300 homicides, and that exceeds or matches uh, the amount of uh, homicides. The last time we hit 300 homicides in Los Angeles back in 2009, and it looks like it's going to be increasing. They attribute it in part to the proliferation of guns, of course, and also the stress caused by a pandemic. Uh, but I'm wondering uh, what you can do as, as the leader of law enforcement and in California, and what advice you could give to us in terms of reforming the penal code to address that very serious uh, problem. Look, I, I think uh, Justice Moreno that California is going faster and farther than most states when it comes to gun safety. Um, we're, I think we're in court in about seven different cases right now defending our gun safety laws. And uh, what I would simply say is, let's not go backwards, let's not stop, let's not slow down because our difficulty comes not from what California is doing, it comes from what other states aren't doing. And so the proliferation of, of some of those weapons is mostly the result of what other states haven't done to match our laws. And so I think part of it is trying to get other states to catch up to California. Secondly, I think going back to the chairman's comments about data, the more we have data, the more we have a better sense, we can match the anecdote to the, uh, to the data to see really where we have to go. And what I think you're gonna find is for example, there's no doubt domestic violence is causing true damage to our society. And there are lots of lives that we could probably save if we just did a better job of understanding the data uh, when it comes to, to domestic violence. And if we recognize that signs of domestic violence where it's physical and it's not fatal, ultimately in, mo in too many cases lead to fatal results, uh, we could probably target some of those folks. So understanding the data, getting other states and the federal government to join California in, in enacting gun safety laws, I think helps move us in, a, in the right direction. I have another question if Thank no one you. else has one. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? Judge Moreno has another Let's, question then I have. Yeah, I mean, here's one. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll go, we'll just, Justice Moreno and then Senator Skinner. Okay, it's more, more or less a comment. I want to appreciate the work of the Attorney General uh, that it does in connection with uh, uh, proposition and referendums on the ballot. They're always confusing, even to someone like me. So I get all kinds of questions. 
And when I was on the Supreme Court, we did review the Attorney General's uh, reformulation, if you will, reformatting of the title. You mentioned bail reform. There's also, I think, Prop 47 Penal Code reform. Uh, you know, what else can be done? I mean, the, the public is really confused as to what these things mean and the ads really just make the problem worse. Uh, but I think it's important to have a neutral uh, reviewer of these ballot propositions and their titles, because believe me, the public has no idea many times which way to vote based on the on the title of a particular proposition. That's more or less a, a comment and uh, something that always bugs me when when election time comes up. <laughs> I don't blame the legislators. This is the popular democracy in action uh, that makes these titles. And Justice, uh, there's not a lot to say other than uh, I, I urge everyone to try the exercise of uh, summarizing an initiative, which in many cases can be hundreds of pages long, yeah. uh, into 100 words. Yeah. Uh, and that includes the title. And it's, it's a bear. But what you try to do is remove the loaded words, you remove the colloquialisms, you remove your own biases and try yeah. to e explain it. And one of the things that I've done uh, is I've used the title to actually explain more. Oftentimes AGs in the past and Department of Justice is in the past in, for in writing the title and summary of these initiatives have simply stated the essentially the theme in the title and then use the body, the re remainder of the body, the summary to explain it. Mm -hmm. I think too many voters, unfortunately, don't even get much beyond the title. Right. And so what I try to do is use the title to give people a clear sense of what the initiative does, which is good in the sense that at least you're going to see in bold letters something about what this initiative does. Bad part is I've, I've consumed several words uh, from my ability to summarize more fully what the, the initiative does. So it's, it's I, I, again, it's a great exercise. I bet if we had that as part of the bar exam, it'd be <laughs> an even tougher California State bar exam. Yeah. I, have, I will just interject here saying that having been part of the process a couple of times before your time, Attorney General, the staff there does an extraordinary job of trying yeah. to be excruciatingly fair. Also, by looking back at past ballot titles and summaries to try to make them as consistent as with the wording as in, in, in future, almost as precedent. But I agree, it's an extraordinarily difficult task. And I share your frustration uh, just with Moreno, I don't know anything about water policy or whatever it happens to be. And um, so it's, it's, it's very hard. And I think that this year is particularly difficult. The, the bail reform, which is a no or, you know, it's a sort of counterintuitive vote yeah. there. So, um, but again, anything that we can do to help, like to, if there, if there are, this is, and this goes for all the speakers, if there are particular statutes that get in your way, Attorney General, like it, we could just make it so much sort of simpler, except for penal code X, Y, Z that just forces us to do it half-assed backwards. Please let us know. Those are the easy fixes that we really, really, really want to be part of. And whether or not it's ballot measures or anything else, that it's just like this penal code makes no sense and it just makes our life much more difficult. That's we're really looking for that kind of thing. All right, yeah. sorry I interrupted, uh, Senator Skinner. Um. Thank you, A.G. Becerra, for joining us. Um, I want to kind of bring us back to uh, our penal code uh, review, which, which is our charge. Um, you made some uh, very important observations, which I think, as have people have expressed, agreed. We should not be, we should do our best through our policy to avoid the situation where we are incarcerating, whether it's the juvenile or the adult. However, much of the changes that we would need to make to address that are not necessarily in the penal code. So, I mean, yes, we could, uh, as Jerry Brown has pointed out, if he looks at the growth of the penal code from the time he was first governor to today, yeah, we could just wipe out a whole lot of it and maybe that might address. But I, I guess what I um, wanted to see if you could offer is any other specifics about certain aspects of the penal code that you feel we should particularly focus on in terms of, because that is the charge that we, we have. Mm 
Michael, did we get, did the Zoom get frozen? I don't know. Attorney General, can you hear us? Yeah, we, you're, um, AG, just when you ask him for some specifics, he, yeah. he, he freezes. Yeah, I think his Zoom froze. Yeah. All right, let's give him a half second to see if he can unfreeze himself. We're also almost at the end of his time, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, <laughs> bless you. Thank you. Um, Senator Skinner. And this goes for all of our witnesses generally that, you know, the more specific, I think the most, I think we'll, we can agree as a committee or I don't wanna speak for you all, is that the more specific the proposals that people that witnesses come to us with have been the most successful in, or, in order to advance. And, with, I, and just as, as I've been working with staff to distill down some of our ideas, it's just so obvious that the specific ideas we've all grasped to, uh, because they've been really well thought out. And um, anyway, well, um, I'm gonna give him one. Um, perhaps what we could do, um, Michael, is, is uh, invite the AG's office um, to submit again, you know, if they are so willing to submit any particulars or any places that they, if they don't want to make a specific recommendation, any particular part of the penal code that they want to make sure that we have looked at um, before we conclude. So we might invite the AG's office to do that for us. Uh, absolutely. And I would also even say that, you know, a subcommittee of this group could meet with staff of the committee to really sort of try to find some common ground. Um, all right. It looks like we've lost the attorney general. If he comes back, we'll, of course, welcome him back. But I'm going to try to keep on schedule. Um, and attorney general, if you can hear us, <laughs> I want to say uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and we will be following up with your office and I really do appreciate your time and your comments. Um, so uh, for, with that, I'd like to move on to the rest of our uh, meeting it's, today. Oh. It sounds like they're, they're concluding that segment. So I don't think he needs to struggle to get back on. They, they, they thanked him and they're moving on. Oh, all right, Brian, we can hear you. But in any event, um, so with that, uh, today's meeting uh, is uh, different from our prior hearings in that there's no specific topic that we're exploring in depth. Instead, we invited panelists this morning to speak about the matters that they feel are most important for the committee to consider as we seek to improve the penal code and in turn the administration of justice in California. Close watchers of the committee will notice that our panelists today are mostly drawn from law enforcement and not the cross section of voices that we usually hear from. We've taken this approach intentionally because I believe that there is greater consensus on criminal justice issues than many people appreciate. Over the last 10 months of the committee's work, I have been surprised, pleasantly surprised, about how many things there is agreement from all ends of the spectrum. We all share the goal of wanting to improve public safety, invest in a fair system, improve the administration of justice in California, and address the root causes of much of the behavior that leads to involvement in the criminal justice system in the first place, as the Attorney General just emphasized. I'm hopeful today that we'll find more to agree about than to disagree about. One final note, a common theme from the committee's work this year from almost all of the written submissions and our panelists and our conversation with the Attorney General today is the need for robust, reliable data. I feel comfortable speaking for the entire committee on this point. We agree in the most strongest possible terms that the solutions to our problems lie largely in the data. It's only by knowing what has worked and what hasn't, who is in the system and who isn't, and how the law actually impacts real cases that we can continue to make progress that will only improve the lives of Californians, but be a model for the rest of the country. The committee has been making extraordinary efforts to gather data on these topics and we will continue to do so, but we can't do it alone. And I invite uh, each of our panelists today to help join our efforts um, in collecting uh, criminal justice data in a way that will be uh, available and useful to as many of us as possible. Um, so with that said, uh, I'd like to introduce our first panel. Uh, First of all, I'd like to give my deepest thanks to each of the panelists for sharing their insights with the committee and taking the time to join us today. 
Each panelist will have five minutes to make opening remarks and we will reserve the rest of our hour for Q&A and conversation with the community, committee. Panelists, please know that we have read your submissions. So in your opening remarks, please quickly, quickly hit the high points uh, and so we can move on to the conversation. Um, really try your best to limit yourself to five minutes and I will uh, admonish those who go over. Uh, I also want to reiterate, and this goes for all the panels, that the committee is not exploring any issues related to any measure that's on the ballot uh, in a few weeks. Uh, our focus is on recommendations for 2021 and beyond, and the discussions today will be most helpful if we stay focused on those issues um, and not what's on the ballot in a few weeks. Um, so with that said, our first panel will begin with law enforcement on the streets and take us to their work inside prisons and jails. Our panelists are uh, Chief Eric Nunez of Los Alamitos, who's president of the California Police Chiefs Association. Thank you for joining us, Chief. Sheriff Dean uh, Groudon of Lassen County and the first vice president of the Cal of this California State Sheriff's Association. Uh, thank you, Sheriff Groudon. And uh, Neil Flood, who's Vice President of the California Correctional Peace Officers Association. Chief Nunez, we begin with you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Eric Nunez, as you know, and I'm the President of California Police Chiefs Association. I wanna thank you uh, for inviting us to participate in today's meeting uh, to share our perspective, which is really kind of the practitioner's perspective. Cal Chiefs is a, a professional association that represents all 332 police chiefs in California. Our police chiefs have been at the center of developing and implementing major reforms and shifts in the penal code over, well, for a long time, over the last decade, for sure, since I've been a chief. Through all of this work, we are constantly evaluating and sharing information about what is working and the areas in need of improvement. Today, I'd like to briefly discuss lessons we've learned through these endeavors and highlight a few examples of unintended consequences. I think the Attorney General re referred to a couple of those. Uh, we've seen from recent changes to our penal code and uh, give you um, the board, uh, the committee recommendations uh, for your consideration. And as you said, I will not spend a lot of time or much time at all on the finer points because you have our submittal uh, submission of uh, our brief, uh, our, our, our comments. And so I'll give you a brief summary, if you will. Uh, Mr. Chair. First, uh, there have been a number of challenges in implementing major public safety reforms in recent years, and our communi communities have struggled uh, dealing with many of the unintended consequences. It is, a, it is critical that we understand and review these major reforms before moving forward uh, to learn from what is working and what is not. Um, you've mentioned this a couple times already, and I believe that to be true. This, is, this review, however, has been made difficult because so many reforms have been passed in such a short period of time with little detailed analysis of the impacts over the subsequent years of their passage. AB 109, Proposition 47, Proposition 57 alone represent dramatic shifts in the penal code, but these are far from the only changes that we have seen. It is important for me to state that, the, that law enforcement was not wholly or philosophically opposed to the core principles behind many of these measures. In fact, we helped with a lot of uh, measures and changes that we've seen that are uh, demonstrative in, in our penal code. Generally, police chiefs are not averse to rehabilitative services and those alternatives versus extended periods of incarceration. So as long as we don't release individuals prematurely who still pose a safety risk to communities we serve or for the officers sworn to protect those communities, and, and you know, we're 100% behind those alternatives. And, um, and, but they have, those alternatives have to be meaningful. And by meaningful, I mean that they are proven effective at correcting criminal behavior or address the root cause of criminal acts. And that uh, there are checks and balances to ensure the individual completes required programming. Um, I think the attorney general mentioned that about some of the mental health issues and not having that safety net. Although there is a merit to the evidence that higher penalties do not necessarily act as a deterrence in and of themselves, it is not the only reason we have penalties on the books. We also know from real world experience, the lack of penalty or consequences uh, have the opposite effect in thwarting criminal activity. Almost every police chief has stories and officers 
have stories of individuals arrested dozens of times for theft who cite Prop 47 and the lack of penalties for their decision um, uh, making and criminal conduct. This should be of concern, I believe, and an awakening to everyone involved in our criminal justice system. Prop 47 is emblematic of other concerns as the initiative reduced penalties on drug and theft crimes, but failed to ensure that there were adequate alternatives and programming available. Although Prop 47 set funding to increase uh, the access to the types of programs, access is still too limited and there are not enough requirements that the programs are completed. Unless we address these concerns, further reductions and penalties will not result in types of outcomes or changes which are good for the public safety. As such, we uh, request this committee to consider these four recommendations. The committee, one, the committee should evaluate and completely uh, evaluate completely the prior reductions and penalties and oversight in reviewing uh, these laws. We ask uh, if there are alternatives required to compensate for the reductions and how have those alternatives or lack thereof impacted the individual outcomes. Two, research what current services are available for those suffering from mental health and substance abuse from the state in various regions. Are there adequate, uh, are they adequate and do we need more? I think we do. Uh, again, if we are going to reduce sentences for specified offenses, we should require treatment address the root causes, as I said before, of the crimes that are being committed. And three, compare California's penal code and sentencing structure uh, to those of other states. We tend to have lower base terms in California because we utilize more enhancements, if you will, and we should understand that there are uh, comparatively uh, that we are comparatively and, and analyze the differences and potential consequences by evaluating all the other systems. And I know that the Attorney General said other states are behind in some ways, but sometimes they're ahead. Review options for compelling those with severe mental health and substance abuse uh, disorders into treatment. This is important in order to make sure we're not allowing those suffering and causing quality of life issues in our communities to re remain untreated. And uh, in the conclusion, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to present. And I'm here, obviously, and happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, we agree with a lot of your recommendations, and we'll get to that. And I look forward to talking to you further. With that, uh, uh, Sheriff Groudon. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to start by thanking you for allowing the California State Sheriff's Association to be part of this process. Um, and I'm going to shift away from my what I intended to talk about to a degree, I wanted to address the issue of mental illness uh, or mental health uh, that the attorney general brought up. Um, the 58 sheriffs you know, across the state, obviously we see a huge impact both on the streets and in our custody facilities. And we agree that there needs to be more on the front end related to mental health crisis response. Um, and also you know, on, the, on the custody side, a lot of these people shouldn't be in custody. Unfortunately, um, there's just gaps in the system currently, and they end up they end up in our jails. And when they get there, we need, you know, to augment those services or bolster those services we can provide to them when they end up in our custody. Um, in my county, a small, poor rural county, but it's large in geography, uh, 4,800 square miles with communities spread around it. And so, what I've done is I've provided the crisis intervention team training to all of my deputies, but our behavioral health agency just doesn't have the resources to respond in the field with us. Um, they can on a limited basis, but you know they're centered out of the center of our county and with so many small uh, communities spread around the county, it poses some real logistical issues. Uh, but that's something that we want, we wanna see you know, behavioral health specialists responding to those calls in the field. And, and we, this, our association supports that. And a lot of counties have really good, strong, you know, CIT programs. In the rural counties, it's going to be a little bit more of a, of a challenge. But I wanted to divert to that real quick. But, um, and then I want to tell you a real quick story. So shortly after public safety realignment was implemented, my alternative custody supervisor, which was a new position under realignment, came to me about uh, someone who was gonna be coming into our custody for a really long jail term. And in reviewing that person's file, it looked like she'd be a good candidate for residential drug treatment. And the reason it became 
uh, came to my attention is because uh, the judge, the sentencing judge and our probation chief at the time were totally opposed to any kind of alternative placement, but there had been no objection at the time of sentencing. So we were able to make that placement. Um, that person, her, her kids had been taken away from her. Um, but while she was in the treatment program, she was able to start visiting her kids. And then before leaving the program or graduating from it, she was able to gain, regain custody of her children back. And the program had, um, you know, family housing units. Um, so it was a really positive story. And then just a short time ago, I teach at our local community college and I went in for the first day of class and I saw that same person's name on my course roster. And it was really um, rewarding to see that kind of an outcome. And the reason I tell that story is just, um, you know, the sheriffs across the state really have embraced, um, you know, the reforms and we're really trying to do the best we can in my county. I mean, it's night and day different, our jail, the way we operate compared to where we were prior to re public safety realignment and other reforms. Um, with that said, there are some complications. One is in the jails, we're really seeing a higher level of criminal sophistication. Um, the jails have been become harder to, to manage. A lot of the jails weren't built for the type of, of inmates we're getting. Um, and also, I like the police chief said, Chief Nunez, you know, the alternative custody programs are important, um, but with the reduced penalties, there are there's little incentive for a lot of these people to participate anymore. Um, so they, you know, they'd rather, and they'll tell you that they'd rather just do their time and because it's such a short sentence than consider some kind of a longer placement in, you know, residential treatment or other programs. Um, and with all the reforms, you know, there've been so much in such a short period of time uh, that we're really still, our staff are really still trying to adapt you know, and implement the full, you know, intent of those legal changes. Um, with that, again, I just want to, you know, thank you for giving us the opportunity to weigh in. You know, it's a, it's a unique time with all these reforms, but I, I just want to reemphasize, you know, that the, the sheriffs um, really have uh, put a ton of work in trying to embrace and support, you know, these reforms. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's pretty obvious that the sheriffs bore the, a huge uh, sea change with uh, realignment, and we've seen a lot of interesting things, both positive and negative, out of that. And we, I think, everybody in the state maybe doesn't appreciate how that burden fell so uh, much on the shoulders of the sheriff. So I'd like to explore that a little bit further with you, uh, Mr. Five Flood. Five minute timer. You did exactly. Where to go off? Yeah, Mr. Flood. Good morning, Chair Romano, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Neil Flood. I am the rank and file vice president of the California Correctional Peace Officers Association, representing 30,000 members within the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. We sincerely appreciate the opportunity to participate with this committee. There have been a number of changes made within the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation over the years, some good and some bad. Ultimately, we all want to see the most efficient and effective system possible a system that works for all the stakeholders and anyone involved with CDCR, which is why this opportunity is so important for our organization to participate in. There are three areas we would like to focus on, rehabilitative programming, incentives, and reentry programs. In recent years, it seems as though the philosophy and the goals of the department is to have as many inmates as possible sign up and receive credits without the credits being merit-based. We currently have programs that may be evidence-based, but not truly merit-based. We know that there are many factors that create pressures for CDCR to find ways to increase credit earning possibilities. Examples of these pressures are gubernatorial, legislative, budgets, and court compliance. The main goal of reducing the population should not come at the cost of legitimate effective programming. Instead, services currently provided do not really prepare the participant for real world challenges, stop the revolving door, or make the public any safer. Today's programs often lead to individuals earning enough credit to be released early without actually attaining the skills to be successful when they return home. The goal should be to get a person 
all the help they need while in our custody and to do so in a way that gives them the best chance to never return to prison. We have seen programs in the past and currently that could be more effective if there was a higher level of accountability for the participant. Some of the other challenges my partners and I have experienced are inmates who would like to get the full benefits of the programs provided, but there are disruptive inmates interfering with these programs. To deal with this particular challenge, there needs to be a process in place that allows for disruptors to be removed from the rehabilitative environment immediately to create a better environment for the people who really want to be there. It would also be helpful if the department would do a better job of assigning the right inmates to the right programs. Both of these problems may seem easy to solve on the surface, but when dealing with humans, locations, and the incarcerated social norms, the answers can quickly become overwhelming. I would like to share an interesting concept that was brought to me by a few inmates that lived in the facility that I worked in for the last 10 years. The system is designed to place you in a facility that is based on many factors, to include age, marital status, commitment offense, et cetera. Based on a score sheet, it determines what facility within the entire state meets your specific criteria and needs. When you begin serving your sentence, you essentially start with an A. Through your own actions and ability to follow policies and procedures, you either stay in A or in many cases begin to work your way down, ending potentially with an F. As the inmates describe, we are young, foolish, and caught up in all that it means to be in prison. The problem is that once you reach the F in prison, or in reality, a classification score that is astronomical, it is almost impossible to recover from your past mistakes. The theory was that it would be much better to start out with an F, and while in your younger, more foolish years, not have those mistakes haunt them for the rest of their incarceration. When you, the individual, decide that you want to change, you could now earn your way to an A and all the programs and services that an A has available to you. In essence, it's more of an emphasis on personal accountability, but with a twist. When you are actually ready and willing to participate, your past didn't dig you so deep that you will never see the light of day. You don't start out with everything handed to you, but rather earn those privileges through your own actions. Finally, if we are to realistically be expected to lower the recidivism rate in any meaningful way, we will have to have sufficient reentry services. Reentry services need to be standardized with an emphasis on merit-based completion. These programs need to be based on core principles. We obviously have the greatest chance for success when the individuals, re individuals returning home have the training for jobs from inside prison and access to those types of jobs that provide a living wage. This all functions best when a parolee is placed close to their support network and family. I would like to end by saying thank you for the opportunity to present today and share some of the thoughts of the association. We would like to participate in putting practical policies in place that will make the system better for everyone involved. COVID has not made this any easier, but we are still optimistic that these types of policies will be created. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all, especially Mr. Flood for mentioning the pandemic. We haven't really talked about that today. We realize that all of our jobs have been challenged in so many ways as a result of the pandemic and especially yours. So, um, you know, thank, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to take the first question and I hope the other uh, members will, will jump in. And I wanted to start with uh, Dean Groud, uh, uh, Sheriff Groudon, excuse me, if it's okay. Um, at an earlier uh, hearing, we heard some, some testimony from uh, academic experts that I found surprising and, and counterintuitive, um, which was that um, controlling for uh, all possible variables, folks who basically committed the same crime, um, but were sent to prison versus those who stayed in county jail, the folks who stayed in county jails ended up with better uh, recidivism rates or better outcomes than those who were sent to prisons. Again, controlling for criminal history and all sorts of different backgrounds. And um, that was a, a little bit counterintuitive to me because um, jails are not known statewide. I, I can't speak for Lassen County for having robust um, programming or certainly not the same type of programming, although deficient as, as Mr. Flood mentioned as CDCR. And certainly I could speak for individual clients that I've had that would generally prefer to spend time in prison rather than county jails. 
Yet at the same time, it seems that the jails had better outcomes than state prisons, again, controlling for the same offense. And I was wondering if you had, if you sort of knew about that study, number one, number two, had any theories about why um, jail inmates, again, for the same crimes, might uh, end up in better circumstances than those um, who were said to, said to state prison? Well, I, I am aware of those uh, st statistics. Um, I think part of it, you know, in Governor Jerry Brown, you know, part of the emphasis behind public safety realignment was, you know, keeping offenders closer to their um, own community, you know, so they were, because no matter what, there are linkages between the custody facility and the community, whether it be, you know, ongoing, if you have your local behavior health providing counseling, whether you have local religious services. Um, also, we, you know, we put a quite a bit of effort into reentry training. And in our facility now, we've, you know, we really give an opportunity for people to, um, you know, reduce their classification level. You know, if they program well, they participate in programs, they can work their way from a pretty high classification initially, potentially, to even, you know, working outside on outside crews and other things. So I, I think the biggest influence probably is just the fact that they're they're local and so they maintain those local ties and support that they might develop while they're while they're in custody. But I also, you know, I know the the sheriffs have put a lot of effort into you know supporting the rehabilitative services. So that's just my opinion. And just to follow up quickly on that, I know of course resources are the key, um, but in general, do you feel that that does the data bear out in your experience that folks who stay locally end up having better outcomes? I think so. You know, the one complication for my county in particular is we have two state prisons in our county, so our our local information sort of gets, uh, you know, it's, it's it might not be really accurate. So we have a lot muddied of, a little bit. Yeah, because we get, so for a, a custody facility that's only a couple hundred beds, at any one point in time, we probably have about 20 people who have committed crimes in state prison, but then local committed a crime while in prison. Now they parole to a local hold in our local county jail. And actually that's been one of the hard hardships brought upon our county um, related to realignment is we have these, you know, we have a level four prison here and so you get these really sophisticated in, you know, criminals that come into our local jail and it really has made our jail harder to manage. And unfortunately, I think some of those offenders end up being a bad influence on the, the local offender. So we really have to pay attention, you know, to the classification and keeping those um, people segregated so we don't make them worse, the local offenders worse when they're in custody. So it's just one complication that comes from being a, a prison county, but but overall handling of the local offenders, we put a lot of effort in helping them prepare for reentry. Mike, can uh, I ask a follow up question to understand that? <clears throat> so of course, offenders you were referring to, um, Sheriff Godin, are not residents of your county. So why is your local jail having to hold them? So what happens is they commit a crime in while they're in custody in prison. And then before that case is adjudicated, um, they reach their release date from prison. And so they're transferred because it's now local charges, they transfer to county jail. And unfortunately, a lot of those violations are realignable offenses. So I have a number of those people at, you know, at any one point in time, I have a number of those people in jail for like two or three year sentences and they're not from our county. So that makes it really um, that's one complication with with realignment that we didn't really anticipate and it makes it difficult let me ask a, let me ask a quick follow-up on that but this is precisely the types of areas of the penal code that maybe we might be able to fix uh without you know i'm not expecting that you have a, a solid or a thoroughly researched answer on this but does it make sense for somebody in that scenario to serve their realigned sentence in the county that they originally were convicted in yeah but yeah the problem is that the DA in our county makes the prosecute, prosecution decisions, um, decides which cases she will and will not file, and so it ends up being the county's burden to hold that that person if she prosecutes locally. So it's 
it's compl it's a complicated issue. It, unfortunately, I don't think there's an easy solution, but it sort of contradicts the no, whole kind of realignment of keeping offenders local. Right, although they are local to LA County, they just happen yeah. to be in your county. So I, I, I'm not sure it's completely, I just don't think the LA Sheriff would really appreciate it, but it's, it, it, in some ways, I think it's more in spirit of realignment to send those people to serve their term. Although I appreciate that the crime was committed in Lassen County. So anyway, it's just something to think about. Um, any event, uh, I'd like to open it up to other members of the committee. Do you guys have questions? Assembly Member Kam Lagerdorf. Thank you. I want to thank you all for um, you know, having the courage to come to speak to us. I'm sure. Um, um, I know this has been a summer of these kinds of conversations. I, you know, I have a, a lot of questions, but I'm I'm really just going to focus on one. I was intrigued by um, the discussion about what sort of happens um, to folks who are incarcerated. Um, given some of the things I have heard from folks who've been released that seem to run counter um, because there's, there, I've heard folks say that there isn't really incentives to participating in some of the educational programs that there's a greater focus put on um, the work programs. But I recognize in listening to you all that you have an awesome responsibility and an awesome amount of power. And essentially, you all are given the authority to pass judgment on someone's rehabilitation and their freedoms. And I'm just wondering if you could share with me your thoughts on actually what kind of training and what kind of educational background you think you need to have or you think needs to be in place in order to effectively um, and equitably, you know, um, distribute that kind of authority and power. Because, you know, I sit on a committee and I use a lot of lenses to help me read through the different proposals that come to us as legislation. And, you know, poverty, addiction, race, mental illness, um, you know, background, all of those things play a huge role in the circumstances with which people find themselves ultimately um, in front of you all. And I think that that requires a, a, a breadth and diversity of training and background. If at some point you all are responsible for determining people's liberties, their privileges, their rate and success towards rehabilitation. So can you all talk a little bit about that? Cause I didn't see any of it in the um, handouts that we were given in preparation for this session. Sorry, so you want about our education or the staff? The in general, your, your employees, you know, the folks who are working in the prisons, right? The folks who are, you know, working in the jails, the folks who are going out on the run. You know, there've been tons of, you know, ultimately you decide if, you know, someone gets into a program or not, or if they've rehabilitated or not, or if they go into a shoe or not, or if they have, you know, um, if they should stay in longer, you know, that's an awesome responsibility. And so I think I'm curious to know based on your experience, what kind of training and or what kind of educational background you think is necessary to be able to participate in making those kinds of decisions about somebody else's freedoms? Can I speak on that specifically? Uh, you talk some prison terms in there, shoe and, and such. Um, the correctional officer does not have any uh, real say in what types of programs the inmate receives or whether or not they successfully completed those programs. All of those uh, baselines are set by psychologists, psychiatrists, educators, principals. Um, however, they do attend at times committee uh, committees where all of those stakeholders are in the same room at the same time to discuss how that person has functioned within the prison system. Um, so the completion of a program is actually uh, done by the person that provided the services. So 
if you are going to get your uh, degree or your GED, that is done by your actual teacher that provides you the services, not by a correctional officer or the administrator of the prison. Um, I will say though, for a lot of the self-help groups that are provided, there does not necessarily have to be any expertise in the field. Uh, for instance, uh, NA and AA programs that are provided within prison do not necessarily require someone that has gone through extensive training in addictions. Um, you could just be a volunteer that shows interest in that, that field and want to come in and help the inmates. So uh, if it's an actual program that has a degree or something, a completion certificate, there's generally a, an expert no different than your kids going to school that is the one choosing whether or not you, you met that criteria. Previously though, um, it required a larger group to make the determination, uh, your behavior during your stay there and, and how good you did on your grades that would make the determination if you, if you actually were successful. Currently, uh, after the 90s, it's now done specifically by the person that provides you the service. So if it's your math teacher, and I know I'm simplifying that, it's the math teacher that determines if you get the certificate or not. So I hope that answers so, the question for prison. Mr. Flood, I actually wanted to follow up on that because um, as you are all uh, well aware, um, there's a lot of interest in Northern European models of incarceration. And one of the big, big differences that we see is that the correctional officers in Sweden, for example, have a two year training program and get the equivalent of an AA degree in criminology or incarceration policies and best practices. I believe the training for being a CO and CDCR is much shorter. Is that something that you think can be, could be, should be enhanced? Should we move, in, would, would a longer and more robust training period for COs be helpful? Absolutely. Uh, we actually have accompanied some of the assembly and Senate over to uh, Norway to look at that model. Um, I will just tell you personally a few things that, that I have observed within prison and, and something that reflects the Norway model. They operate on a much smaller scale for each one of their facilities. And this kind of came out when the county sheriff was talking about his facilities. I think there's a lot to be said for a smaller community and its success than when you're in essentially a large community. It's almost like the difference between being in a city and a little town. Uh, the state prisons are much more of a larger community functioning with thousands of people participating versus a couple hundred. Um, the Norway model is very fascinating because it does have a success rate. Again, though, kind of with the presentation, I know from my partners that went to Norway to look at it, there was a lot of personal accountability, which I think reflects both on the, the chief and the sheriff said, you know, if you want to participate, you, you get the benefits. If you're not, if you're not ready, I can't make you go to the program unless you want to go to the program. Um, so as it relates, yes, more training and the Norway correctional officers had more of a say in how you function day to day and whether or not you were actually doing the things needed uh, to complete the programs. I, I mean, they ate dinner with the inmates they really kind of lived almost as a community within them. Uh, and so th their say mattered a lot more in uh, the success of the program. I will also to say that just incidentally, or perhaps not incidentally, that the cost is about twice per inmate in Norway than we, we spend here in California. So and the, it's, not, uh, it's, not a, it's not a cheap model. Yeah, oh. the ratio of officer to inmate is uh, like <laughs> three to two, three officers for every I'm sorry, three inmates for every two officers. Got it, thanks. Other questions? I would just point out that Norway's population is just slightly in excess, the whole country, slightly in excess of 5 million people. Small town, basically, relative to the United States. And it's a, it's a homogenous population as well. So it's, it's, it's nice to look at that, but it's, maybe you might be comparing apples and oranges in terms of uh, <clears throat> the demographics. Well, I, you know, I, I want to thank you, Mr. Flood, for that. There, I was uh, really thinking about what you said about the teacher. The teacher does give the grade, but oftentimes the teacher does it in concert with the teaching assistant who talks about the students 
rapport, their, you know, their attention to detail, their questions about homework. So I do think that there is a relational aspect to the work that you all do. And I think many of us want to figure out a way to, you know, enhance that in a way that protects everyone um, involved. Are there other questions? All right. I really hope the members chime in because I'm going to run the table here because I have a bunch of uh, questions for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, where did you go? A uh, Chief Nunez. So you uh, mentioned some unintended consequences with laws, specifically with 47. Are there specific fixes? Again, I admonished everybody, let's try to avoid Prop 20 and you know what's on the ballot. But are, are there specific fixes that you could recommend that you think would both achieve the spirit of Prop 47 or other measures, perhaps 47 doesn't need to be, that, that you think that we could focus on? Again, the ideal fix for us is something that is a small interference in something that you do every day that we don't, or the legislature doesn't quite understand or appreciate how much of a hurdle that is on your work. Are there, are there things in the penal code that are just like, if this could only go away, or if we only had this authority, it would make things so much simpler and easier for us. Are there specifics that you can think of? Yeah, I'm going to probably refer to uh, my experience of being working with collaborative courts and uh, specifically with the drug court, sitting on the drug court committee. And, um, and, I, and I'll just say anecdotally, attending uh, drug court graduations where these folks have been um, plagued with substance abuse, sometimes half their life and seeing them graduate from an 18 month long program uh, and seeing the families who've also been, you know, have had to deal with the issues of the drug influence and, the, and some of the stealing, the violence, and all the stuff that happens at home as a result of drug, uh, drug abuse um, and substance abuse uh, is, is just overwhelming to witness this and the transformation. As, as a person on that committee and, and, uh, and seeing how many people would sign up for that and, and it was a difficult task to do. Well, I think part of, um, and you said, uh, Prop 47, when, what happens with that, when we, um, we reclassified all of these drugs, uh, simple possession to, um, um, from some of them from uh, felonies to misdemeanors, essentially they get a ticket for um, possession of heroin and methamphetamine, anything like that. And they just go on their way. Before, um, we in, in, and I hate can, I, to use, can I just interrupt there? Yeah. Can I just interrupt there? I appreciate that the penalty for drug possession went down from a felony to a misdemeanor. But if you could just describe a little bit more, because my understanding is now, of course, they're crowded jails, but let's assume for the time being, and I think as of today, jails are generally not crowded, but um, you could still get a misdemeanor, which is up to a year in, um, in custody. That seems to be, and I understand what you're saying about carrots and sticks and you need to have incentives, but a year in custody seems to be sufficient incentive to participate in the drug court program. I realize it's not 18 months, which is what you had said. Why isn't that, why isn't that year leverage working? Well, they wouldn't be in custody uh, during that year and a half. They'd be free to live their life, but applying themselves to a drug program, and that's a big difference. Um, right. No, but I guess I, what I understand is a big complaint about Proposition 47 in general is that pre previously, if you had a felony and a longer sentence over your head, that was a greater incentive to participate into a drug rehabilitation program. Whereas now, I, correct me if I'm wrong, what you're saying is that Prop 47 took away the, um, the hammer, in other words, and said, well, I, rather than participate in a long drug rehabilitation program or drug court, I'm just going to serve my very short time in county jail and not worry about the, the drug program because that's a lot easier spending 10 days in jail than you know 18 months in a program, which I completely understand. And that makes sense. And I think that that, if that is counterproductive. And I realize that that is in part related to overcrowded jails, which is in part related to realignment. However, at least for the time being, my understanding is that jails are not uh, at capacity, that there is room to hold people for up to a year, right? Drug possession is can still be punished for up to a year. And that would still, to me, but correct me if I'm wrong, seem like sufficient incentive to still participate in a drug rehabilitation program. Am I understanding the, 
the dynamic? I, I think it would, it would probably be an incentive, maybe uh, because the penalty is potentially there if that was actually the reality. I don't think, uh, and, and I think the sheriff would um, uh, help me in, in describing the situation, but I know that, you know, when you have 8,000 prisoners in, in county jail, not able to transfer to prison that are supposed to be prison, those, they're filled up with, uh, with uh, people that are incarcerated in jails that should be actually trans, uh, transferred to prisons that aren't gonna be in prisons. COVID-19 also impacted that because they were actually early, releasing people early from jails as well as prisons. So those, the reality is of whether they face that or not, um, you know, the penalty is one thing. I'm talking about trying to get folks help. And, and, and the fact that they can get that expunged from their record at a later, you know, once they complete that is, is also a huge incentive for some of these folks. And, and uh, so I, 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 you know, I don't, um, I don't know if that, if that were true. I don't know why somebody, you know, why it wouldn't be more of a concern for them, but it definitely isn't a concern. And we don't have as many people going to drug court and attending 18 month long programs um, so I, I mean, that's the reality of the situation. Do you have the, one of the things as again, uh, this is gonna, this is a repeating theme. I just could, might as well put it on a, a repeat loop for everything. Do you have the data on the drug courts and participation? No, but I, we will provide that for you. I, I, I can get that from Orange County at least. Um, in the club. Okay. okay. We would, we, yeah, we would love to see that and to see really how Prop 47 has or has not impacted and where that they, it's because we we heard uh, at an earlier session from collaborative courts. I think there's great support for collaborative courts. Part of the problem is it's very difficult to legislate um, um, the effective collaborative courts. Um, so that's difficult. But if there are statutes that are getting in the way of specific uh, uh, of the the ability for collaborative courts to work effectively, that's a, certainly something that we want to look at. And again, I appreciate that this crowded jail problem creates these short term misdemeanor sentences, but that seems to be a problem of capacity, not necessarily the statute. Now, of course, they relate to one another, but um, so, but, but just so I understand the, the issue that you were trying to articulate, which is if you don't have a sufficient penalty hanging over your head, you have very little incentive to participate into a collaborative court system. Is that the basic piece are, that you're saying? I think, yeah, and I think of the penalty, but I think it's also the incentive to get it removed that, uh, from your record is uh, um, having successfully completed 18 months uh, of that program is what I'm saying. How might, how could we improve that? I don't, well, it's there if they, if they attend it, but I, I, I think that's part of the reason why they don't is they don't look at the incentive as much as they don't, they, they're just doing, you know, they're getting, a, they're doing drugs. They're, they, they're in a bad place in terms of addiction. And, uh, and it takes, a, it's just not something that they feel compelled to do because there's, there is no other, like you said, the threat of a year, uh, they, they're not seeing a year, they're, they're getting cited. We cite people out, you know, every day and for drugs and then they go and, and then, and they get, but they could they, they could get a year. The statute says that they could get they a could. year. It's a matter of crowding and yeah. it's implementation on both ends. It's the implementation that they don't understand that the reward is sufficient and that the hammer is sufficient. So it's an implementation issue. Now I realize it related to crowding and, and this is an ecosystem of of populations and demographics and statutes all coming together. I appreciate all that, but I just wanted to make sure I understood the, the yeah. issue. And, 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 I, and I apologize because I missed Chair. I don't think it's necessarily just, a, like you said, it's not just a, a penal code or a change in our penal code. It's, it's also because of what's impacted us over the last, you know, seven months. Right, right. And we're trying to wish away that problem for our purposes. And hopefully by the times that laws that we are, or statutes that we're recommending for the next legislative cycle, and they become in effect, you know, many months later that will hopefully will be beyond or at the back end of the pandemic issue. So, and I realize that, as I said, that you're all uh, working under extraordinary and unusual circumstances. I'm gonna keep going unless other folks have questions. Uh, okay, this is a question for uh, Sheriff Dowden. Um, one of the things that we've uh, uncovered is that it appears that the credit system 
between jails and prisons are different, meaning that people who've committed the exact same crimes, the same people uh, are getting different credits, whether or not they're housed in county jail or in state prison. In some instances, they get better credits if they go to prison. And in some instances, they get better credits if they stay in county jail. And just on its face, that doesn't seem to make sense to me. I was wondering if you knew about this dynamic, if you had thoughts about the credit earning availability and the disparity between credits in jail and credits in prison. Yeah, so, so the base credits, the good time, um, work time credits are both 50%. So in response to part of Chief mm -hmm. Nunez is on the, you know, it, that one year sentence on a misdemeanor is six months. Um, but on top of that, you're probably talking, there's a variety of other um, credits available to offenders. And yes, they do differ between the state prison and county jails. Um, there are, we do have milestone credits in the jails now, and I know they have those in the prisons too. And those are earned through, you know, program completion. Um, but I believe through Prop 57, there were additional credit earning opportunities that were applied to state prison inmates that I'm, I'm not sure that they apply to the county jails. So, so for example, county jail, one of the problems is, is that uh, county jail credits are legislated by statute and CDCR credits are, are CDCR regulations. But milestone credits in county jails, my understanding are capped at six weeks. That's the maximum amount of credit that you can get for participating in milestone programs in county jails. In state prison, it's 12 weeks. Is there a reason why that there should be a difference? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we, okay. we, we have them in our jail. Um, we have milestone credits in our jail. Obviously not all inmates get those, the, the penal code section that regulates those it, you have to have a, you know, an outline position with, with accomplishments they have to make to earn those credits. Uh, but we do apply those. Um, yeah, I'm not, uh, not really sure. Oh, and then fire camps well, also get two for one credits within. Right, the they, so, yeah. So those prisoners, that's an example of where prisoners get more credits than jail inmates, same guys, same crimes. Um, and I was just wondering if they're in your opinion, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I know that you haven't prepped you for this, but this is the kind of thing that we're looking at when it, you know, our mission is to rationalize the penal code. To me, that seems not rational. Uh, there are also folks who have committed nonviolent crimes. You're right, get 50% credit in county jails, but if they have a prior strike, they get 50% in county jail. As soon as they hit prison, they get only 30% or 33%. It, that seems to be the op opportunity to game the system, just happenstances to where you happen to be transferred when, how long your trial took to go to trial. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. I don't know if you have thoughts or reactions yeah. to that. And I don't know, I think, you know, maybe it's because the, the sentences in jail tend to be shorter in term. I don't know, but, but typically you're not gonna have someone sentenced to prison and jail on the exact same violation. Um, they, they might be similar, but obviously- a lot What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is the same person who is charged with a nonviolent crime but has a prior strike, all their time waiting in jail, pre-trial and post-trial, they'll be getting 50% credit. The day that they're sent to prison, that credit changes to 30%. I understand. Correct. Same person, same exact person. Um, and that doesn't seem to make sense. It would make sense to, same as a defense person, lawyer to say, crime. same person, yeah, same person, same crime. And as a defense lawyer, I would stall the trial as long as possible, keep me in jail as long as possible. Don't, you know, precisely because I'll have to spend more time in jail. Um, so in any event, that, that those are the kind of things that don't seem rational to me on its face. I'm asking you, and maybe we can have a conversation longer about there might be some reason for it, but these things to me seems they should be equal. Um, same person, same, same crime. And I think it's a rep, my hunch is that it's a relic of the idea that the jail credits are established by statute, whereas the prisons are done by regulation and they're not necessarily harmonized. But yeah, and I, one that's of another the, area that we're 
Go ahead. One other thought is, you know, before someone's, everyone earns the same credit earnings when they're in custody before they're sentenced. And that seems like that should be, it should be that way, no matter what crime you're charged with now after sentencing and going to, to prison and the, then they earn different credits based on their type of violation. I'm not saying that's correct, but, but the reality is everyone should receive the same credits pre before sentencing if they're pretrial. Sorry, can you explain that again? And, and assembly member com logger, you seem to be. So what I'm saying is everyone earns 50% um, time pre-trial. Regardless of what you're charged with? I don't think that that's correct. You're charged with a homicide, you get 50% yeah. credit? For the time you're spending in jail? Pre-trial? Well, maybe not. Maybe they calculate it different when it gets to prison, but we apply it as you know 50% crediting earning pre-trial. Pre Maybe on the more serious offenses, maybe CDCR, once they get into custody, they calculate those different. So I shouldn't probably comment right. on the topic because I don't know enough yeah. about it. But. Uh, again, at risk of putting you on the spot, same prisoner, same crime. Should they get the same credits in jail and prison? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, you know, the ones that gain the, have the hot, fewer credits are in prison for very serious crimes. So that's a that's a policy decision for the legislature to make, not you know. Well, we're trying to make recommendations to I, the legislature. That's, that's that's our point. I understand. Um, all right, all right. We've we've belabored uh, this this point uh, enough. Um, Mr. Flood, I had a question for you about the A through F program that you described in terms of the custody levels and credits, which. I, I agree that the custody levels are, are, are hugely problematic. My understanding of the way that it works, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you come into CDCR and you're given a classification score. Some of those factors are kind of, I think, not necessarily relevant to your security status, you know, if you have military service, if you're married and things like that. But for the most part, as I understand it, your security score is based on your pri any prior prison behavior and your current offense, right? And so let's just keep the math easy. You're given a score of 100, right? And that would put you in a pretty serious um, facility, probably a level four facility. It, it seems to make sense on its face that you do well and you could get that score down, which would bring you down to a lower facility. Uh, vice versa, if you create problems, then you can get your score raised up and bring you back to a more secure facility. So can you just flesh out a little bit about how you might revise that and use this A through F uh, metaphor, because you, you certainly, I understand that you want to give all the incentives for people to improve and program and do better, but at the same time, obviously, we need to recognize that people are going to do poorly, and we need to give a higher classification scores to people who fall into that category too, right? Right. So, uh, actually, in the last couple of years, there have been some changes that allow essentially what you're saying, uh, your, your behavior to dictate overriding that score. Um, Previously, how it was, was uh, each crime that you committed in prison um, came, or, or each violation, I should be more clear, each violation, some of them being crimes, came with a certain score that you accumulated if you were found guilty of that violation or crime. Um, and the process of getting rid of those point scores were uh, usually roughly eight points per year based on good behavior. Um, I'm, I'll just use examples. If you committed murder or attempted murder in prison with a weapon, that would garner you a score of 28. Now you would have to go essentially four and a half years just to get rid of that one score if you behaved yourself after the fact, losing those eight points per year. So there, the classification system has changed a lot, even from the 90s till now, trying to essentially create a scenario that once you decide to stop, sorry, I'm going to use the term being bad or not following the rules, that you could eventually actually get to the programs needed to rehabilitate you. So um, the same as it worked with a uh, shoe, which was brought up earlier, um, you have seen inmates that were previously in shoe that had a, a, a classification score of 30 
but based on their activities that they had done gang wise that that social norms of prisons uh now moving out of those and landing in lower facilities that have more robust programs available to you a, a level one a level two um and i will say just in the last couple of years and hopefully i'm not bouncing all over the place but in the last couple of years we have seen those facilities actually have an increase of violence and an increase of mass disturbances based on these very quick changes to classification scores um, or overriding criteria. So when the inmates describe that story to me, which is still relevant, but has changed in the last couple of years, um, if you essentially were uh, not doing the right things for your first five years in prison, if you were playing in the gangs and, and you were violating a lot of rules, you could build yourself up into a classification score of 100 and losing eight points a year by finally behaving yourself, it's gonna take you quite a bit of time before you work yourself down to a lower score that gets you into the prisons with more programs. Um, so, would you so would you suggest an enhanced um, override system or what, what, how do we fix this problem that you're identifying? I mean, many of it, it's obviously very interesting because you could look at it from many different factors. Uh, we were just talking about like attaining uh, incentives or, or your milestones and credits. Prison in 1995 used to be, you were good for a day, you got a day off your sentence. Um, and, and that type of incentive made it so that the inmates behavior day in and day out really dictated what type of credits they've earned. Uh, then the laws changed and made you serve 85% of your time. And, and there's some, maybe a little bit of backlash of what difference does it make if I, if, if I do the right things or not, I'm still here for 85% of my time. And so trying to juggle that classification score is really about trying to make the population that you reside in as safe as possible. So higher classification scores put you in a more secure facility with more oversight, not just for you, but for the other uh, convicts that you're interacting with. Lower classification scores have bigger populations, more robust programs, and less oversight. Um, and so really the classification score along with credit earning are two separate things, but they work together because if you don't have a low classification score, you cannot necessarily get every single program CDCR has to offer you uh, is not available to you based on your location. I, ho I hope that explained it. But. Yeah, no, no, I understand the system. I guess I was just wondering how do we improve it? Um, and is it more carrots and less sticks or is it more overrides or more individual review or more programming in the higher uh, security facilities? Or, I mean, you could, again, we have only a couple more minutes left on this panel and I don't want to monopolize your time, but we would love suggestions. You know, the more specific the suggestions, the, the more helpful they could be. Senator Skinner? Yeah, just because, um, Mr. Flood, you raised the issue of in the 90s, the, uh, the incarcerated person receiving, in effect, a day of credit for a day of good behavior, in effect, is what you described. Are, I want to understand, but do you feel that that was a better system than our than the current one, where where it's uh, the participation in these programs? So, it, it, I, I mean, yes, to an extent, it may have been better. Again, as it really goes back to that personal accountability, if you didn't want to get up and go to education that day, you didn't earn that credit. If you didn't want to get up and go to the job you were assigned, you didn't earn that credit. So it was very much based on the individual applicant's desire to participate. Um, but with that was a lot more oversight where uh, you just attending an AA class and getting a, a certificate didn't didn't necessarily get you the credits. It was an actual oversight of an entire committee looking into not only how you did in AA, but how you did in your job, how you behaved in your free time. All of that stuff kind of uh, meshed together to determine if you were ready to continue on or not, or if you were going to essentially earn those credits off of your sentence. So was 
some people I could imagine hearing that would think that that was more subjective potentially than say just the straightforward you participate you get a credit can you imagine something that's closer to what you were describing that has less that you could uh, design to have less of the subjective aspect sure I, I mean you can obviously you split it you, you can allow for a certain amount of subjective I, I think this probably goes back to that Norway model um, I as a correction officer don't really have a say in uh, whether or not you earn a credit, but I am essentially in charge of your care and watching how you interact, react, and what you do all day long. Um, and so if the idea, though, is, is to really make sure that you're prepared to go back out in society and be successful, it really is dictated on how you react in the environment that you're currently in. So um, I think there should be some base level of the credits that you earn just by completing the program, but there should also be a look at personally how you are physically doing as a person within your little society before we shove you out in the real world and, and, and hope that you don't come back because they do apparently keep coming back. In my short career, I've seen so many leave and you say, good luck and I hope you don't come back and I see them a year later. What happened? No. Hey? So doesn't that happen to a degree, though, um, because even though we have these credit programs you're describing and they do, um, it mostly reduces the uh, amount of time before you go before the parole board, but the parole board then looks at your file and if you have various uh, disciplinary actions or such, if, 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 for example, the correctional staff have written you up for various things that is then factored by the parole board. So, and I'm not defending any of these because you know we're we're trying to get at the root of how do we how do we address getting a system that works that works with the objectives objectives you have the objectives we have. So, um, are uh, uh, do you think there that aspect of the parole board being able to factor? The, the insight that you as the correctional staff get is adequate or not? I, I think it should just be a part. It should never obviously, you know, it should have a piece in the puzzle to try to, to fix what's going on. Does that answer that? Because I, I guess before we can correct the issue of um, how the credits are assigned, which of course you've raised some, is that it doesn't, as far as I understand, it doesn't automatically reduce your sentence. It gives you the ability to go before the parole board earlier, unless you're on the few people that are on that more fixed sentence issue. And I'm not an expert on this either, but yes, some people are on a fixed sentence and some people go to the parole hearings uh, and not everybody uh, is in a parole hearings scenario. Right, right. So those credits apply to people on the fixed sentence also. Yeah, okay. So we've reached the, the most the end of the time for this session. I, I wanna say just a couple of things in closing. First of all, I realize that um, each of you are, you know, your, your primary responsibility is enforcing and implementing the laws that are written and enacted by the legislature. And you're not, you know, uh, legislators are necessarily uh, chief policymakers yourselves in, in many ways, um, and we and, and I appreciate that you know you're 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 put in a little bit of an awkward situation here about like trying to follow the law and and we're trying to ask you well how is that working and you know can you please give us recommendations and as long as we're you know dealing with um, you know the carceral state I'm just going to say no good deed goes unpunished in that we really do hope to uh, circle back with you. Um, as we develop and, and try to hone in on a couple of um, proposals um, that we work for forward this year and the years in, in advance, I really, really do appreciate your time. Um, and I think that on some of these big amorphous issues, we really are, there's a, a tremendous amount of consensus around mental health, about community safety, about that the institutions that we have aren't necessarily doing the best job that they can. 
The hard part is figuring out what those specific fixes are. So um, if you, first of all, I'm just gonna say, if you're, you know, have a brainstorm in the middle of the night and say, hey, this penal code section would really change my life for the better, please let us know. We are all ears and we're probably circle back to each of you as well um, to run by some of the ideas that we've had. Now, you know, we've spoken to about 50 or 60 different witnesses at this point and trying to distill down a few areas where there seems to be consensus and making thing, the system work a little bit better. So again, I, I really appreciate um, your time. Um, thank you again, we will be in touch. Um, I'm gonna take a, a five minute, oh, Senator Skinner. Um, apologies, um, Chair Romano, I did wanna quickly ask a question of Sheriff Groden. Before as long as we, as, lo as long as we got him, go. Okay, Sheriff Groden, um, you referenced uh, the, um, the mental health issues and I think we're all pretty well aware of that. Unfortunately, due to lack of appropriate or enough uh, facilities and such, not within the jail system for people suffering from mental illness, <clears throat> our jails have a, well, also our state prisons, but now I'll just tuck jails for a minute. Do you have a disproportionate number of people who are struggling with mental health issues? So I guess what my question is, and uh, if you wanna reflect on it longer, but our, is our realignment, is it too oriented to only compensate for the holding in a jail cell versus uh, use being able to <clears throat> enable a county to use the money for the mental health program. And the reason I raise it is we, we do, uh, there, there is a, um, I know the counties feel sometimes it's not adequate, but there is a lot of state funds that go to counties due to realignment. And you know, we it, part of the problem of inadequate mental health facilities is often raised as a budgetary issue. So I just wonder if if that if you see any <clears throat> issue with how we've defined the realignment formula that if by some tweaking might help to direct more of those funds towards appropriate mental health treatment rather than holding those people in jails. No, I mean I think uh, it's. The counties have a lot of autonomy on what they use that money for. So I think they could use it um, for those purposes. You know, in our, in the rural counties, the hard part is, I mean, we have no facilities in our county whatsoever. So we end up having to transport down to like Sacramento, Santa Rosa, you know, Central California to me, what I'd call Central California uh, counties. And the problem is when you're starting from zero, just the, it's an enormous cost to get a facility like that off the ground. I think if you were talking about expanding services, it, it might be possible, but um, the amount of money our county gets is a neat, yeah, I wouldn't really put it, you know, contribute much towards that kind of facility if we used every dime of money we got. You know, and another thing I think we need to talk about or that needs to be, you know, a lot of these people you know, they come into the jail system because they're committing very low level crimes over and over again. And um, a lot of these people don't need to go for a 72 hour hold. They don't need that long term, longer term placement. A lot of them just need some kind of short term crisis intervention. You know, unfortunately, a lot of them are under the influence of something at the time, whether it be, you know, drugs, alcohol, or just, you know, fear, anger, whatever, you know, they're going through something traumatic in their life at the time and they need that short-term intervention. And that's where I think we could make some real headway is by expanding on the number of local, like crisis housing or even, you know, sobering facilities. But anyways, I, I do think there's enough autonomy uh, with the realignment funds to use it for those purposes right now. I just think that there's just such a big gap, especially in these uh, rural areas that unfortunately, I don't think that money is enough to meet that need. Thank you. I mean, that's a you know, continuing problem. We have a huge state, you know, we've Los Angeles and then tiny counties and, you know, trying to one size fits all is very, very difficult and challenging. Well, anyway, I'm going to reiterate my appreciation to everybody. Thank you so much. Um, and now I'm, I actually am going to take a five minute break. So I have a 1040, 
let's 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 get back uh, online at 1050. So that's a seven minute break. Thank you all very much. I promise we'll be back in touch. Thank you for your time.